Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Shall we open our Bibles to Psalm 90? The 90th Psalm. And we'll read verse 12. Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. May God speak to us through these words. This verse is telling us that when we number our days, we receive a special wisdom from God. But God has to teach us to number our days because we don't know how to do it. Because as human beings, we are used to numbering our years. We number our years, we don't number our days. How do we number our years? Every birthday, we add another year. We say God added another year. And we count the days that we have spent or the years that we have spent and we count it from the day of our birth. We don't celebrate every day but we celebrate one day in the year our birthday and we say that is my birthday and therefore our age goes up by one. Therefore your age reveals the number of years you have spent on this earth. We number our years. But do we ever number our days? The psalmist therefore asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to number our days. So what is the meaning of numbering our days? There's a difference. Numbering our years means we are numbering the number of years we have lived in this world, meaning from our birth till now. But numbering our days is different. Have you come across the phrase, your days are numbered? What does the, your days are numbered mean? You have so many days left to live on earth. So many days before your death. In other words, numbering our days, we don't number from our birth, but we number from our death. Numbering our years is something we do from our beginning. But numbering our days is something we do from the end. When we number our years, we are happy. We are having another birthday. But when we number our days, we are made weary that we don't have much time left. So we don't count up, but we count down. God is telling us that we must count down or understand that we have very little time left when a rocket takes off probably a few minutes after that a report will be given saying it's now 8 minutes since the rocket took off and now it is at this, at this position but days after its travel and towards the end they won't be saying it's been now 7 days or 9 days or 3 they'll say they say we have another two hours more. Another half an hour left. Two minutes left. That is counting down to destination. So God says in the Bible that more than counting the years, counting the days are important. More than counting up, counting down is important. More than the beginning and knowing how long we have lived in this world, it's more important to know how much time we are left. And when we number our days, we receive a new wisdom. I call it the throwing out wisdom. When we realize how little time we have left, it does something to us. As we see in the example of St. Paul in his ship, when he was traveling by ship, they loaded that ship with so much wheat. But as that ship was nearing its end, Suddenly a storm, the Eurocladon beset that ship, battered it 
and broke it into many pieces. And when they realized they were going to die, when they realized that the end was near, forget how old or how young, we have only a few hours or minutes to live. What happened? All that precious wheat in the ship was jettisoned, thrown into the sea. Why? There's no use of these things anymore. We put it in because it was useful, but now we realize it's useless and out it goes. There are many things we have accumulated in our lives. Many things that we have added and added and added and added, not realizing these things retard or slow down our progress. That is why the author to the Hebrews in chapter 12, he tells us, when we are running a race, we must be careful about two things. Read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore seeing we also are compa- compassed, about compassed. With, compassed about with so great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This man of God says that there are two things we must put away. One, sin. The other, weight. Two things, sin and weight. They are, they are two different things. Sin is something that is definitely wrong. And it must be put away. Now he's using the analogy of an athlete who's running a race. Say, in modern races, now forget the races we run here in this hall, but I'm just talking of the modern races where the world's greatest athletes compete. When they finish, they're all within one second of each other. But how do they decide who's first? Because microseconds are involved. The first person could be, say, 9.75 and the next person will be 9.71 or 69. You see, it's such a close shave. So, in order to become faster, they can't become 5 seconds faster. It's only microseconds faster. So, the, the athlete has to do so many things. One thing he has to do. There are certain things that are a definite no-no. He cannot eat as much as he wants. He has to have physical exercise. He has to keep his body in good shape to be able to run this race. But that's definite. But in addition, there are certain things that he has to do. For example, he can't wear clothes that are too heavy on him. He has to lay aside weights or things that slow him down. They say even an athlete's shoe has three parts to it. And uh, to enable him to run faster. The length of his hair. Everything matters in order to give him just that little bit of extra speed. In our spiritual life too, there are certain sins that are definitely to be put away. But there are certain things which never would be counted as sins. Because they are harmless in themselves. When we look at them, they are harmless. Nothing wrong in themselves. But... When we start numbering our days and we realize there's only little time left, we think, why must I waste my time doing these things? Why must I waste my time in these things that will not profit? Like the wheat in that ship, we begin to jettison, throw away these things, once precious and now useless. That's a special wisdom that comes upon us when we number our days. Are you numbering your days, dear child of God? Our days in this world are numbered. The end is near. And we must not think, Oh, I've lived so many years and I've got so many more years to live and plan our lives Planning, 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 not realizing you have very little time left. Why is it important to number our days? Because the Bible tells us that the end of our lives is more important than the beginning. If we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and read verse 8. Better is the end of a thing 
Ing then the beginning thereof and the patient and in, in, in spirit is better than the provident spirit. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The word better can be understood as more important. More important is the end of a thing. Everything begins well. Everything has a date of manufacture. But remember, you pick up any object and you see best before. There's a date, an expiry date. There is an end too. For us, there's an end. And more important is this end than our beginning. Dear child of God, it is not how we began, but it is how we end that matters. It's not the first mile, it's the last mile, that last lap that is important. Prophet Balaam was a man of God. He was a prophet. He could see visions with his eyes open. He was a gifted prophet. And his desire was expressed in a few precious words. He said, let me die the death of the righteous. He wanted a good end. He wanted a righteous death. But the Bible tells us that his end was not righteous. The death of Balaam the prophet was not as he wanted. Because the love of money was so strong in him, it took him away from the will of God. The man who wrote these precious words that our end is more important than our beginning was King Solomon. And the Bible tells us that his end was not better than his beginning because the love of pleasure destroyed him. The love of sin ate up his life. He had this wisdom, the understanding that the end is more important. Unfortunately, he did not apply that wisdom to his own life. How important it is that we don't just teach this. I stand here and say these words, but I'm, I'm trembling because I don't want to be here preaching to you. I want this wisdom for my own life. Even if no one obeys, I want to obey it. That is why I need this wisdom. Our end is more important than the beginning. If you read verse 1, we understand something more about that in the second part. Who, who is as the wise man? Where are you reading? Ecclesiastes chapter 7. A good, ma a good name is better than... The second part. And the day of death than the day of, day of one's birth. Mm. The day of death is better than the day of one's birth, is what the man of God says. The day of your death is better. Remember, we have several birthdays, but we have only one funeral. And you can celebrate your birthday in style, but your body will be left here while your funeral is being conducted. Where you are, only God knows. One pastor said during the funeral, most number of lies are uttered in the church. The man who died, about 20 people will come and testify what a good man he was. Only his wife knows how much he used to beat her, how much he used to scream and shout. But you all will be saying, this man was an angel. Only the family knows he was a fallen angel. The end is so important. Remember, you celebrate your birthday on earth. But you celebrate your death in eternity. And if you are in heaven, in the presence of God, you will be celebrating forever and ever and ever. But what if your end is not glorious? And you end up in the place that you do not want to be. Forever and ever and ever, you will be tormented by the day of your death. I wish I had died well. I wish I had given more importance to my end. So there's a simple truth about the end of a person. How does a person end his life? He ends his life according to how he lived his life. 
our end depends upon how we lived. That's what we read in Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 37 and verse 38. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall, shall be destroyed together, the end of the wicked shall be cut off. The end of the perfect man is peace, but the end of the wicked man shall be cut off. Dear children of God, our end is so precious. I remember when I was reading a newspaper many years ago, I read an article about a university student, a young girl called Lorna Spinks. I'm, I still remember her name because that article was so vivid. She was a good girl. Her parents loved her. Her friends loved her. Her faculty teachers, they loved her. Everybody loved her. She was a good girl. Very ambitious. But she went into many bad ways and began to consume drugs. And one day she had an overdose of ecstasy. She was 19 and she immediately began to react. Her friends didn't know what to do. She began to bleed through every orifice. Eyes poured out of her, uh, blood poured out of her eyes and out of her ears and out of her nose. And, and they tried to stop her bleeding. But that wasn't the main thing. She became exceeding violent. She began thrashing so hard that they had to belt her down. They strapped her down. They tried to speak to her. But they were there. Her friends were there as her life departed. And the friends couldn't talk about it for a long time. And then they said, what we saw was terrible. We looked at Lorna's face and we saw hell. We saw hell on her face. There was such sheer terror on her face as she was dying because she was going to a terrible place. They all spoke well about her. But why did she end like that? Because her end depended on how she lived. That is what we must understand. We don't know when the end is. That is why we must number our days. How close are we to the end? Is there any way for us to know? Is there any way for us to realize it? If we knew our end is near, we wouldn't mess around, would we? We wouldn't gamble with our lives. I would like everybody to pay attention. Every child, pay attention. Because children die as well. Think of the people in Japan. Three days ago, how many of them would have been planning out great things? Must have been planning a holiday or planning out some great ambitious project. I must do this and I must plan out my business. I must do this with my family. Who knew? Who knew that their lives would change forever in a matter of days? If they knew that they had just about two days left. The truth is that Japan is the nation that is most prepared for an earthquake in the whole world. Students and office goers, generally the general public, they are often subject to drills called earthquake drills. They are even taken to places where they go through an earthquake simulation. They are made to react to an earthquake. They've gone through all those drills. In addition, even the buildings in Japan are so safe. The components of a building are attached to each other with special bearings that they are like shock absorbers. Buildings just sway, they don't collapse. But more than anything, Japan has got the state-of-the-art warning system an early warning system that there is going to be an earthquake. Now nature itself warns us. If you look at fish in a fish tank, before an earthquake the fish begin to behave very strangely. 
they begin to start jumping in the water. Birds react. Animals react. They all seem to sense something is going to happen. But Japan also had an early warning system and this time it worked. Minutes before the earthquake struck, all through Japan, television screens were warning the people. And many millions were saved because of that. They were warned. Minutes before. And lives were saved. But the question is, spiritually, do we have an early warning system? It is a good thing. It is a blessing to be warned in advance. The Bible tells us that God warned Noah. He did not warn all the people. He warned Noah. Then he told Noah, Noah, you warn the people. To warn the people was not a very pleasant ministry for Noah. It was easier getting lions into the ark than warning the people. The Bible makes us understand that the people in his time would have been mocking him, ridiculing him. Talk about rain. Talk about building a boat, carrying animals in it. This is absolutely ridiculous, Noah. You've gone mad. And Noah had to continue to warn the people. Even the father of Je the earthly father of Jesus, Joseph, was a man who was warned by God in a dream. Because he responded to that warning, his child was spared. Jesus was spared. Now the question is, how do we respond to warning? God sometimes warns us directly. He warns us through people. He warns us even sometimes through our children. He can warn us through one another. One person can see a dream and come and tell you, you know, I had this dream about you. What do we do? We sometimes ignore the dream. I heard a story of a, a businessman. He was about to fly in the morning to another country. Just before he left the house, his watchman came to him and said, Sir, are you planning to fly anywhere today? He said, Yes, I'm planning to fly to, to, to Europe. He said, Sir, I want to warn you, please don't fly. So he asked, Why? He said, Because I had this dream last night that a plane was crashing and you were on it. Now the businessman had a choice and he chose to listen to the warning. The plane never landed. It crashed. And the businessman was saved. So he really profusely thanked the watchman. He gave him thousands and thousands of pounds and sacked him from his job. Why? The watchmen are not supposed to see dreams. Anyway, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that the businessman listened to him. He didn't just fire him and say, you were dreaming last night? Though he knew he did wrong, yet he listened to him. Is there anybody in your life who warns you? I praise God because there are servants of God who, who still warn me. And I do not at any time want to come to a place where I am beyond warning. I also need warning because I am a foolish person. I don't have wisdom. I need wisdom. So I praise God. Even two weeks ago, some servants of God, they said, you know, we want to warn you. And they gave me some warning. Is there anybody in your life who warns you personally? Probably your own family member warns you. But the thing is, do you listen? Do you listen to warning or do you rubbish the warning? Sometimes you rubbish the warning because of the person who is warning you. You feel that person is prejudiced against you, doesn't want you to do this. Maybe you're planning something, your wife says, you know, 
I have this feeling, don't do it. Uh, you and your feelings, I didn't ask you for your counsel. Your wife always has a premonition, but she's paranoid according to you. So you don't want to listen. Your husband warns you, no, you won't listen. Do you ever listen to a warning? God warns us sometimes through people, but there are times He even warns us through the Word of God, through messages, because the ministry of warning is the Apostle's ministry. If you turn to Colossians chapter 1 and read verse 27 and 28. Colossians 1, 27 and 28. To whom God would make known that is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, mm. whom we preach. Whom we preach. We are preaching Christ. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We always put this verse behind a preacher's head for the people to see all the time. But for some blessed reason, I don't know why, the word warning is always taken out. Because maybe if you put warning here, people won't come and sit here. So whom we preach, that we may present. But see, we don't just preach, we have to warn. Just imagine, we all have a journey to undertake. And we have to cross a river to the other side. Because our spiritual life is a journey. And I'm telling you, we have to cross the river. And you say, brother, I don't know how to swim. The truth is, I don't either. But I have to teach you now. So, I teach you how to swim. But, I've heard that there are crocodiles in that river. What is my duty? I have to teach you how to swim. But I have to warn you about the crocodiles too. If I only teach you how to swim, and you start swimming... Who is to blame if you become ums and two? I am to blame because I never warned you. That's my duty. I have to warn you. But it is not pleasant. It's not a pleasant ministry. I've had all kinds of names given to me, praise God. Doomsday preacher. All kinds of titles I've been branded with. But it's all right. I'd rather you curse me now and bless me in heaven than bless me now and curse me in hell. So the ministry of warning the people is very, very important. But it is not done to frighten the people into obedience. We are not warning you to frighten you into obedience. The ministry of the, the apostolic warning is not a threat. The apostolic warning is done in tears and love. I will give you two verses to support that. First of all, Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Acts 20, 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I, see, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Hmm. I cease not to warn every one of you night and day. If Paul was warning the people night and day, probably he wasn't a very popular preacher. A big weakness that preachers have is uh, the desire for popularity. And uh, if, we, if we are pleasant preachers, preaching all about love and Faith and encouragement. Don't worry, somehow you're going to make it. Well, those messages are good. But if there's no warning along with the teaching, then only half the job is done. The desire for popularity can make many preachers keep back some things from the congregation. But St. Paul had a testimony every time he left a place. He said... I am free from the blood of all of you because I did not keep back anything from you. I have not shunned to declare the whole gospel to you. The whole gospel, not just the beginning, not just the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of perfection. And Paul had a good conscience every time he left a place. He said, whatever the Lord told me to share with you, I have shared with you. As I told you before, Probably I think I'm, I'm more mellow now. 
I haven't probably not even started but in in most of the places I go to they they tell that he's a preacher every Sunday he comes with a bucket of stones he puts that bucket next to him and he starts stoning us and I don't know if it's a good testimony or a bad testimony but that's the testimony I have got a preacher who stones the congregation if the stones lead you to the throne it is worth it but it is not a pleasant ministry to warn people because people may start hating you they start backing off there have been times after I preached there was a place where the faith home and the hall were both attached I said God I don't want to preach this message and God said no you have to I said I can't it's too hard it's too painful I know how the people are going to react I try to escape every time I turn this way God cornered me then I decided to do something which still I could kind of maintain a good conscience you know this passage that the Lord was giving me I just shut the Bible and said no instead I'll pick up my daily Bible reading and I'll, I'll preach from that I turn to the daily Bible reading and it's that passage I said God I can't escape so I stood there in great fear and I shared the word and as soon as I finished my benediction I took my Bible and I ran away <laughs> I couldn't face because I didn't know what the people were going to say sometimes the apostles were persecuted and even we have our pastors Pastor T.U. Thomas was a preacher who fearlessly preached he called himself a terrorist he said I don't fear man but because of his preaching, so many churches, the, the believers said, we don't want him. They did everything to push him out. We don't want him. We don't want him. He's, a, he's, he's preaching against us. He's coming to condemn us. The warning ministry that the apostles have done have truly helped the church because it, it, it enlightens us and shows us the path that we have to take. Dear children of God, when we look at what is happening around the world today, don't you think that is a warning? Think of what is happening recently. There have been a spate of earthquakes. And they've, of course they all happen along the ring of fire as they call it. A place in one corner near the Pacific where the tectonic plates of the Pacific and Philippines and Eurasia all meet together. And earthquakes happen all the time. There are thousands of earthquakes every day, but they are very minor. But the earthquakes that have been taking place recently have been uh, earthquakes of a major level. In other words, these tectonic plates, which are about, say, anywhere between 5 kilometers to 50 kilometers thick, they are moving, they are constantly moving. <coughs> And as they move, they come to a place where they meet each other and they grind each other and then one tries to get over or under the other. It's called subduction. And if they move, one moves under the other, that creates an earthquake. And if, it takes, if it's a submarine earthquake, meaning it takes place in the sea, like the recent earthquake in Japan, then that sudden movement triggers a tsunami. And when the plates, instead of grinding against each other, they pull away from each other, they create a volcano. All the magma from inside, they are spewed out. So these are all things taking place. And this earthquake that took place in Japan is a very strange earthquake. Did you know that Japan has actually shifted? The position of Japan has shifted because of this earthquake. It has moved by 2.4 meters. A quake doesn't do that. The entire nation has shifted. And one of the prophecies that were, were uttered last year, well, it's not a prophecy by a saint, but about what is going to happen in the world is that the earth's axis, the earth is going to shift around its axis. And they said it can't happen. But things are already happening. And we can see this is, a, such a warning. The earthquake in Japan was 8.9 on the Richter scale and to some people that's a big number but they don't know the significance of it. So put it this way, 
just imagine all the nuclear arsenal, all the nuclear warheads throughout the world, all brought together in a place and exploded at once. Not just ordinary bombs, nuclear bombs, all brought together and exploded at once. The earthquake in Japan was 1,000 times bigger than that. That is how much energy was released. As a consequence, so many things have happened. A tsunami was triggered off 500 miles per hour, slamming ships and boats into houses. And uh, a nuclear reactor exploded and today... Probably while I'm preaching, it might have happened already. The second nuclear reactor in danger of exploding. Already radioactive material has leaked. About 50 people have been affected. So many thousands, about 170,000 people have been evacuated. One nation can't cope with so many things at once. But this is the way that nature itself is speaking to us. As a consequence, so many disturbing images have been uh, now all over the papers, all over the screen, the media is giving us so many terrible pictures of what has been happening. Pictures of the, the waves, the wall of water, about 30 feet high, crashing inland. As you can see here, that tsunami of water sweeping into the Sendai airport. And as a consequence, so many houses have been ravaged. Actual full buildings have been seen floating across the water. And uh, ships, boats crashing against each other in the sea. And uh, a vortex created right in the middle of the sea. A whirlpool, that's a killer. Anyone caught there? Forget it, you're out. And even... This, uh, the nuclear plant being affected. All these things happening together. What does this have to do with us? Is it just news? Is it just something happening? Or does that have a spiritual significance for us? The Bible tells us that this earth and all creation is groaning. Waiting for the coming of the Lord. If you turn to Romans chapter 8 and read verse 21 to 23. Because the cre cre creature itself, creature, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation and groan, groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What is St. Paul saying? The Bible is saying that even creation, all creatures are groaning to be delivered from bondage. What bondage? See, this earth is not in the state that God created it. This earth came under a curse. Every animal in this world came under a curse since the sin of man. And earth is also longing to be free. Freed from this curse. And that freedom comes during the millennium. One thousand years where curse is removed from the earth. Oh, if, we, if I teach you about the millennium one day, you'll want Jesus to come now. Because the millennium is going to be so glorious. One thousand years in this world. There's going to be no pollution. There's going to be no fear. Such a reign of peace. Jesus himself will be on this earth. And we will not be limited by distance or time. You, you don't need a visa. You can just go anywhere you want. In one second you'll be there. So if the Madras convention takes place. And I'm preaching here, right now. You're tempted to go and attend the healing service. So what do you do? While I'm preaching, just go down this aisle, go down that door. I think you're going to the toilet. 
you could go see the healing meeting and come back a few minutes later and come and sit here and continue hearing the sermon. That's how the millennium is going to be. There is no limit for dist- of, of distance. These limitations are in these, this body, this physical body. But in the millennium, God willing, we shall all be in our resurrected body. You walk through walls and you can visit planets. That's so glorious. And yet it's not eternity. It's still earth. And if earth can be like that, what is heaven like? One day probably we must study. What is heaven like? It's an exciting study. But dear children of God, now we must understand, it's not just us longing for heaven. Even creation is longing to be free from bondage. This verse supports what we learn in science as the second law of thermodynamics, which says that any system will not continue as it is, but will eventually run down, get disordered, and die. Everything is happening as this law states. Yes, everything is coming to an end. Creation is speaking to us. The whole earth is groaning. What is the earth groaning for? Thermodynamics tells us it's just everything coming to an end. But St. Paul gives us a better explanation. The earth, nature itself is groaning. Did you know that nature speaks? If you read the book of Brother Lawrence, who wrote this, uh, The Practice of the Presence of God, truly a godly man, he was saved by looking at a tree. No evangelist, no one came, pleaded with him, took him down the aisle for an altar call. He was saved when he was just sitting and watching a tree. And many people have had beautiful experiences when nature itself speaks. It's God speaking through nature. They can hear the whisper of God in their conscience. Nature speaks. And even practically they say, those who, well if you have a garden, here's a little help for you. They say those who who are tending plants, they have found that plants respond to music. Those who sing songs to plants, they are gentle with plants. They found those plants respond well. These are all been tested and proven. And those who are rough with plants, the plants also respond. They don't grow properly. And there's a language, some very intricate language that animals and, of course animals have, but plants, even plants have. Nature itself has life. And God created it. And these nature... This nature is longing for freedom. Waiting for the day. When can I be free? And St. Paul says, not only nature, even we ourselves also, we are groaning. When can we be free from this body? When can we be free from this bondage? When can we be free to be with the Lord? St. Paul lived every day longing for the day when he would see the face of Jesus. Now, Creation is warning us. The end is near. God is warning us. He gave us a promise at the beginning of this year. Behold, I come quickly. And even in our midst, as we've been hearing over the past few weeks, we've been hearing different testimonies of people who've been sleeping. But God is waking them up. Some have been sleeping for several years in this church as believers. But God is waking them up. My question is, have you woken up? You know, it's so easy to be a member in this church. I'm telling you about my own life. The Lord woke me up too. But before He woke me up, I was an active member of this church. I was doing many more ministries than you could ever imagine you would do. Servants of God had a very high regard for me. Because I just knew how to behave in the church. You know how to look... How to walk. You know, servants of God are there, so you have to be very careful, isn't it? How to dress. You know everything, how to just get by in a church. But I know who I was. And if the Lord had not woken me up, honestly, He didn't just gently wake me up. Some, You can't just gently wake up people. God has to slap you. He has to shake you, beat you, kick you, probably break a bone 
and only then you wake up. But it's better to wake up now. As the psalmist says, Lord, lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. It's better to wake up now and to remain awake. As the man of God says, he says, though I sleep, yet my heart waketh. Though I am sleeping, my heart doesn't sleep. It is the voice of my beloved. I can hear the voice of my beloved. While you are sleeping, God will speak to you. Sometimes He will wake you up. How many of you have had that experience? God wakes you up in the middle of the night. Pray. Pray. And what do you do? Yes, Lord. Yes. And you turn the other side. And you say, Lord, the position is not so important. The prayer is so. Lord, really Lord, bless my family and bless me. I just testified for you, didn't I? (laughs) Dear children of God, do you hear the voice of God? See, I had a believer. He came and complained about his wife to me. I got really angry with him. You know what he told me? Brother, please. There's only so much I can bear. She's not letting me sleep. I asked why. She keeps praying through the night. Instead of sleeping, she's praying. I said, do you know how many brothers are telling me that their wives, they sleep during prayer. And you got a wife who prays during sleep. I wish she prays more for you. Dear children of God, these are indeed the last days. And we must be a people who can be awake. St. Paul warns in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just keep reading from verse 1. But the times and the seasons, brethren... Kind of, if possible, read every word. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, For yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Now listen, yeah. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Mm. Let us not sleep. Let us not be drunk. You know what happens when a person drinks? He loses his sobriety. When he's drunk, why do people drink? They want to forget their problems. They want to forget reality. They want to forget the, what were situation. So they drink. You know what we also do? We also drink spiritual drunkenness. When we know that there's a problem and we know that Jesus is coming soon, we're hearing the warning. What do we do? We don't want to listen to the warning. Instead, we turn on the radio, turn on the TV or turn on the internet. Entertain ourselves. Entertainment is the alcohol of the church. Entertainment, always wanting to be entertained, something to keep me going, something to keep me happy. Constantly wanting to be entertained. I like everybody to listen. Okay, everyone, everyone, even the children should be listening. Dear children of God, we must not seek to be entertained. We must seek to enter the kingdom of God. That is more important. But what does the Bible also tell us through St. Peter? You know, some people are choosing not to listen. Choosing not to respond to the warning. It's called willful ignorance. You hear the warning, but you pretend you didn't hear. You know God is speaking, but you act like you didn't hear. Because if you respond, it means, or if you have heard, then you have to do something about it. Rather, pretend you never heard. You read Second Peter, chapter 3. Verse 
verse 4 and verse 5 and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning to the cre- beginning of the creation for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of god the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and mm. in the water see for this they willingly are ignorant of on the day of judgment they want to tell the lord lord i never knew i did not know i was doing wrong i did not know you were coming soon i was ignorant but why will they have no mercy because they are willingly ignorant they are choosing to be ignorant they don't want to know the truth They are trying to turn a deaf ear to the truth. They want to enjoy the world. They want to enjoy the pleasures of sin. So they turn away from warning. God warns and they don't want to be warned. They want to be happy the way they are. You know, the one word in English for that is complacency. Complacency means, you know, just being satisfied the way I am. We heard of earthquakes. But there's another killer another killer called the volcano. The volcano also is a terrible killer. Volcanoes are also nicknamed as mountains of fire. Now, how many of you have actually seen a volcano? Nobody, you're just like me. I haven't seen a volcano, but I have done quite a bit of research into what actually happens during a volcano. Volcanoes are called mountains of fire and they have a mouth on top through which all the molten rock called magma are ejected and from deep inside the earth they burst open and they cause great destruction. The greatest destruction from a volcano is not the The magma itself, it's not the fire itself. It is when everything descends and molten rock and ash, superheated, starts tearing down the volcano, the sides of the mountain, as an avalanche. Now that is called a pyroclastic flow. And that is the most dangerous. It travels excess of 100 kilometers per hour. And anything in its way is blackened and incinerated. Be it a village, be it a person, be it a car, anything. The first breath vaporizes the internal organs of the person. And the body is almost instantly turned to charcoal. It's a terrible killer. A list of hazards associated with volcanic eruptions is given. It's a long list. They say toxic gas clouds, ash falls, pyroclastic flows, avalanches, tsunamis, mud flows, lava flows, as well as secondary effects such as fluoride poisoning, starvation and disease. All these things happen causing death. But... Listen to what experts on volcanic eruption say. The greatest killer, the greatest danger of all, the greatest hazard at potentially active volcanoes. Do you know what it is? The greatest hazard is not in the list I mentioned. The greatest hazard taking the most number of lives is human complacency. Do you know why? Because volcanoes don't erupt every day or even every year. They erupt whenever they want to. And people are warned. When there's an earthquake, they are warned. They are warned. There may be a volcanic eruption. So they are evacuated. Then nothing happens and they come back. Then again, there's a warning. They are evacuated. Then nothing happens. They are brought back. When this drill goes on, after a while they get fed up. They said, we run away and nothing happens. We're going to take a risk. The next time we are warned, we won't run away. And they stay there and nothing happens. And they've saved themselves such a big trouble. And this spreads. And what happens to the people? They're living by the volcanoes, living in villages right near the volcano. But they are fully 
convinced that this is dormant. It's not an active volcano. It's not going to erupt. And they remain there. For example, the second worst volcanic disaster of the 20th century occurred on the 13th of November 1985. Scientists were warning constantly about the eruption, the likely eruption of Nevado del Ruiz. The local authorities, however, they took it very easily. They never gave the warning to evacuate until it was too late. What happened? The town, the entire town was engulfed in a pyroclastic flow and within two hours, 25,000 people were carbonized. See, this reflects the state of the world. People do not want to respond to warnings. They get too used to it. Warning, warning, warning. We're hearing all the time. Like the story goes, tiger, tiger. You know that, right? Yeah, we keep hearing it. Nothing happens. So we become complacent. The world now is totally ignorant of the reality. What is this trying to tell us? People are refusing to give up their sinful ways. People are refusing to believe that God is speaking. God is warning. See, the end of the sinner is not just being carbonized by a volcano. He's going to a worse volcano. Hell is a volcano itself. And the fire there will not finish its job for all eternity. So how terrible. Like the volcano has a mouth. Even hell has a mouth. Isaiah tells us the mouth of hell is enlarged. And it is not satisfied. It wants more and more and more people. So the warning of God is apparent. The warning of God is very clear. But people are choosing not to listen for whatever reason. I've got a very important lesson to show you from history. A very important lesson as a warning from history about what happens when we don't listen to the warnings that are given to us. God gives us warnings. Servants of God give us warnings. And it's our choice to listen or not to listen. But what happens when we deliberately choose not to listen? Is what I would like to show you from this example. An example from history. Now, there is an abbreviation, or may I call it an acronym, which is known... S-O-S It's not sauce What is S-O-S? You know when S-O-S was created It had no meaning It was chosen for convenience Later it was turned into an acronym meaning Save our souls And we all know that we have a soul and this is an accepted as an international distress code of a person who is dying. Maybe he is perishing somewhere. Today they don't say SOS. They have to say, Mayday, 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 three times. But, of course, it, it wasn't SOS in the beginning. It was, I think, a CDQ or CQD or something like that. Now, SOS means save our souls. But isn't it very strange they are thinking about their souls only when they are dying. Save our souls. They wait for the last moment to shout SOS. When God has given you an entire lifetime for your soul to be saved. But they wait for the end. Save our soul. Save our soul. The first SOS in history was sent just hours before a ship sank. The operator, John Phillips, sent that SOS in the early hours of the morning. The date, 15 April 1912. The date will tell you something, yes. It was the Titanic. The Titanic itself has become a, an example, a metaphor for a disaster waiting to happen. And there's a lot you, you can learn from this. I believe this is also a warning from God, which you will see now in a few minutes. 
The Titanic was not an ordinary ship. This amazing ocean liner was a legend. It's, it was 900 feet long, a 900 foot long hull, 46,000 tons in weight. This giantess was the newest, the largest and the technologically safest and most luxurious ocean liner the world has ever produced. The people aboard this cruise liner were the richest and the most elegant people of this world. They were all chosen, handpicked and made to enjoy its first journey on the 10th of April 1912. It began in the UK. Where was its next stop? No. Its next stop was France. Its third stop was Ireland. And it never reached its destination, New York. It perished before that. Do you know where it was manufactured? Ireland. Okay. Belfast. But that's, knowing that doesn't mean you know anything about Titanic. You, there's so much you need to know. Now this Titanic set off on its maiden voyage on the 10th of April. Now they said, this is the safest ship in the world. Even God cannot sink it. Do you know why? Because this was not an ordinary ship. It had a, a double bottom. And it had 16 watertight chambers. Even if it crashed into an iceberg, and an iceberg hit the first chamber, and it filled with water, the Titanic was designed to still stay afloat. What if the iceberg hit the second? It would still stay afloat. It was designed in such a way that if an iceberg hit the third and ripped the fourth, it would still stay afloat. It would not sink. And yet, on the morning of the 15th of April, Titanic hit an iceberg and was doomed. Do you know why? Because the iceberg went all the way and ripped the fifth chamber and stopped with that. The moment it ripped the fifth chamber, Titanic was doomed. This magnificent ocean liner, you know, so splendid in its construction, it shivered and shuddered in the ocean. And then rising 250 feet high up in the air, this Titanic, it snapped like a biscuit and sank into the waters of the North Atlantic. 1,522 people aboard went down with it. Of them, the majority screaming, clinging to each other in clusters like swarming bees. They looked up at that moonlit sky for the last time of their lives before drowning in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. Very strangely, just before they died, they were singing, Nearer my God to thee. Such an irony. How people sing and testify on a person's death. That he was an amazing person. Nearer my God to thee. But this incident raised many, many questions. And I'm going to tell you how this incident took place. In reviewing the active failures that led to its disaster, they came across many startling discoveries. Anyway, the newspapers reported that Titanic finally sank. It was an unbelievable event. No one ever imagined it would happen. And it, the unbelievable happened. And uh, probably the hand has to be pointed first at the man below. And that man is the captain of the ship. His name was Captain Smith. And captains are ultimately responsible for everything that happens on a ship. Captain Smith was informed. He was warned. There is an ice field ahead. There is an ice field ahead. Reduce your speed. But Captain Smith 
made a decision as the captain. He decided not to slow down. But do you know why? Because he wanted to break a world record. He wanted to reach the destination two days early. So in addition to the magnificence of the ship, he wanted to tell the world it's the fastest ship as well. So instead of slowing down, he went ahead forging at full throttle a breakneck speed of 22.5 knots. Captain Smith went down with the ship. It's not just that. A ship of this size can have many problems. So they had to be careful. And did you know, on its journey, even before this accident took place, there were two other accidents. A fire had broken out and it had already collided with another ship called the New York. But they ignored these little warnings. Sometimes God permits little warnings in our lives. Little things to take place, a little knock here, a little knock there. It's a warning. Before the big earthquake struck 8.9, if you look at the map, you will see that in that very place there were many earthquakes. They were major earthquakes in their own right, but they were ignored. Warnings are ignored. Now, there is something more about the Titanic. The officer who sent out the SOS, his name was John Phillips. Now, this officer was responsible for sending out the SOS. If he had sent it early enough, probably rescue teams would have landed there. But what did Phillips do? He said, we don't need to keep radio contact. This is an unsinkable ship. So he had turned off the radio. He refused to maintain radio contact with other ships because we don't need it. We are not going to sink. He asked the senders to stop transmitting messages. Phillips went down with the ship. Although he had a chance to escape. He had to stay there because he had to keep sending out the SOS. And when the first that um, the, the, the SOS was sent, it was sent along with fireworks shooting up into the sky. They, they had the distress signals and people could see it, but it was too late. It was too late. There's always a time, there's an end. Now Titanic... Thirdly, underwent only seven or but seven hours of testing. That's all. And the majority of the crew who were supposed to be there for the testing were not. Overconfidence. Nothing is going to happen. Fourthly, the person who was supposed to be the lookout, watching ahead to see if any danger is going to take place. He was an experienced seaman. And he was the first person to spot the iceberg. But he also spotted it too late. Why? Because he could not locate his binoculars. How careless. It was found, the binoculars was finally found 80 years later along with the wreck. Fred Fleet was his name. He went down with the ship. The ship was also short on safety supplies. He did not have enough lifeboats. And uh, the officer of the deck, he was an experienced sailor. When he heard the warning, iceberg ahead, he made a mistake as well. Of all these mistakes, the greatest mistake they say was inadequate uh, lifeboats. The lifeboat on a ship is an is essentiality. It is very important. It had to have 32 lifeboats. But Titanic had only 16 lifeboats. The reason was this. Bruce Ismay, the owner, decided we must not add extra lifeboats because then we will be cutting down on the space that can be given to the first class passengers to pamper themselves, enjoy themselves. So forget the lifeboats. Let's enjoy life. These things have much to tell us. History tells us that finally, this is a, the SOS finally sent from Titanic. It's all too late though. They were pleading for help. It's too late. Some people wait until they are dying to confess their sins. Some people wait till they are dying to repent. 
all through their life they ignore the warning igno 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 even young people children you think you're very smart smarter than your parents parents warn you you ignore it ha i can live my life yes you can but on the day you're dying you'll be sending out an sos pray for me please help me i heard of a, a believer a young person there were two servants of god involved in his life and uh, there was one servant of god who was very jovial very playful and would love to just have fun with him but was not interested in his spiritual life but there was this other servant of god who had a long nose you know he would always poke that nose into his personal life and ask him you know are you praying how's your spiritual life and he didn't like that second servant of god but he loved the first servant of god because it was lovely to keep his company and so enjoyable even put his arms around him and you know they could go for a meal and have fun together he enjoyed that but he did everything to avoid the other servant of god one day this believer became very ill and he was dying and he's dying he turned to his wife and said can you call the servant of god and so she immediately took up the phone and he said wait who am i calling he said i'm calling your favorite servant of god he said no he's he's a good man but i don't think he can help me in my present situation call the other one dear children of god your soul is very important more important than your body more important than your food more important than your happiness your holiness is more important you have one soul and may your soul be saved don't wait until it is too late let us understand we have a limited time and therefore we want to somehow be ready for that day shall we all stand